Humans are often fascinated with power because it gives us a sense of control and influence over others or our surroundings. Power can make people feel important, secure, and capable of achieving, but power has multiple sources. If it is not from the right source, it can result in bad consequences. In this series, we're studying the book of Ephesians. Paul wrote Ephesians as a letter to the churches in Ephesus. At the time he wrote the letter, he was in prison in Rome. He wrote the letter to encourage the Christians not to lose hope despite the opposition and his being in prison. We look at the gigantic scope of the power of God exercised in our behalf and its availability to us. You may view our past and present videos at sabbathschooldaily.com. You can obtain the study guide for this series at sabbath.school or ssnet.org, all of which are at no cost to you. Holy Father, we thank you for the power you have made available to us. Help us to accept it and use it to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Power comes in many forms and can be used for good or for evil. For instance, some people are social climbers. They seek power in social settings, such as the individual who wants to be the most popular, obtaining a huge following on social media, or being the center of attention. Such individuals crave the attention of and admiration and respect of others. In their minds, they feel that this gives them a sense of importance when they feel that they have social power. Social power, however, is not all bad when we are led by the right power and it is not selfishly motivated. We need power in our lives, but what power? Previously, we talked about a divine power that is not measured by horsepower, the social ladder, charms, amulets, or some form of enchantment. Real power is seen in God's intervention throughout human history to save humanity. It is revealed in one, Jesus being raised from the dead, two, Jesus' status or position of exaltation on the throne of God. Three, all things in the entire universe placed under Jesus' control. And four, Jesus placed as the head of God's church or all God's people on earth. We also talked about Paul beginning his letter to the Ephesians with a note of thanks and praise to God for what he has done to save us humans. Now we come to the final part of Paul's prayer report found in Ephesians 1. 20 through 23. In these verses, Paul is praying that the Holy Spirit will help the believers in Ephesus understand how powerful God is and the extent to which he has exercised his power on their behalf. Ephesians 1, 20 through 23 says, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he puts all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who feels all in all. To help us and the Ephesians understand what God has done for us, Paul starts by talking about two of God's interventions to save humanity. One, Jesus' resurrection from the dead, and two, Jesus' position with God on his throne in heaven. For a deeper understanding of the power involved in Jesus' resurrection, read 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 22, Philippians 3, 8 through 11, 
and Hebrews 13, 20 and 21 and 1 Peter 1, 3. Pay particular attention to what is said about the value to us of Jesus being raised from the dead. The belief that Jesus rose from the dead is crucial to the Christian faith. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, and 17 talks about just how important it is for us to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. He says, and if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. It's not possible to be a Christian if we don't believe that Jesus is risen from the dead. It is because Christ is risen that faithful believers with anticipation hope faithfully for the grand future resurrection to eternal life at the time of Christ's return. The point is, when we accept that Jesus rose from the dead, we also will have hope that our loved ones will rise from the dead when Jesus comes back to this earth as indicated in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23, which says, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, afterwards those who are Christ's at his coming. We also look to Jesus today for all the blessings he promised. One of the promised blessings is the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Because we believe Jesus rose from the dead, we look to him today for all the blessings associated with his death, burial, and resurrection, including his promise of the power of and presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Paul in Ephesians 1.20 gives us a picture of Jesus seated on the right hand of God. He says, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. What is interesting is that this picture of God sitting Jesus on his right hand is one taken from Psalms 110 verse one. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. This passage in Psalms is often quoted by the writers of the New Testament. As a matter of fact, it is quoted by these writers more often than any other scripture found in the Old Testament writings. For instance, Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, 6, that God raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Moreover, Paul in Ephesians 4, 8 through 11 tells us that Jesus went to heaven to keep God's promises and to give gifts to his church. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might feel all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. So in Ephesians 4, 8 through 11, Paul warns us not to get the wrong idea about Jesus sitting on the Father's throne. Jesus is not inactive. He is busy even while he is sitting. You see, Paul wants us to see Jesus working with his spirit. Jesus sends his spirit to everyone on earth to save them and to help them win the fight against sin. Paul's portrayal of Jesus sitting on the throne in heaven 
is not just an illustration of the divine power offered to believers, but he is also the source of that power. Therefore, we are advised to put our focus on Jesus. We are to look to him. Why not take a break from your busy schedule and find a quiet place and spend some time with him? If you do this, you'll receive the amazing blessing that he wants to give you. Spend time thinking about important and pure things. Put aside the negative thinking so often presented by the enemy. Then when you are busy and dealing with struggles, your spiritual strength will be renewed. This power that Jesus offers to us is our only hope in a world that is captivated by the enemy, Satan. But to obtain it, we must accept his offer. Our acceptance involves accepting Jesus' death as the payment for our sin and believing that he rose from the dead. Our acceptance of Jesus is not indicated just in words, but also in our words and deeds. Besides the ultimate almighty power of Jesus, I'm sure you know that there are, of course, other powers operating in this world. Why should we not even think for one second to entertain these powers? Keep watching. Continue to part five. Christ above all powers. <music>we see Paul praising God the Father for the position of power and authority he has given Christ Jesus. God has given Jesus power and authority over leaders, authorities, government, and so-called experts. God has given Jesus power and control over everything in this world and the world to come. In Ephesians 1, 21, Ephesians 2, 22, and Ephesians 6, 12, Paul also mentions evil spiritual powers. Ephesians 1, 21 says, far above all principality and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Ephesians 2, 2 in which you once walked according to the force of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. And Ephesians 6, 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. In line with what Paul says in these verses, Dr. Luke, a physician who traveled with Paul in Acts 19, 11 through 20, tells the story about the seven sons of Siva who operated using evil spiritual powers in contrast to the miracles God performed through Paul. Now, God worked unusual miracles by the hand of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the deceased left them and the evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jews, exorcists, took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirits answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. 
Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. We learn from Dr. Luke that Ephesus at the time of Paul was a center for the magic arts. Magic art is the practice of using charms, amulets, spells, or rituals to attempt to produce supernatural effects or control events in nature. Clayton E. Ernell, in his book titled Power and Magic, the concept of power in Ephesians, expressed that during New Testament times, people in the kingdom of Rome believed in spirits. The Roman people believed that spirits controlled every part of life. A magician's job was then to figure out which spirits were helpful and which spirits were harmful. So the magicians learned how the spirits worked. The magicians also knew about the different skills and powers that the spirits had. With this knowledge, a magician controlled the spirits and commanded them to do things for him. The magicians used special jewels, amulets, or words to command the spirits. With the right words, a magician could heal a person who had a spirit-induced sickness, or a magician could have a spirit to help someone win a horse race or chariot race. So the magicians knew the names of the different spirits and what each spirit did. Knowing this, the musicians were able to distinguish which spirit to ask for help. Paul's point in Ephesians 1.21 is that Jesus is more powerful than all these spirits used by those practicing magic. Jesus has power over everyone and everything, and his power will last forever. That is why Paul in Ephesians 1.21 says that Jesus has authority over everything that has power in this world or in the next world. The evil spirits that worked in Paul's day continue to work today. Evidence of this is seen on TV, in movies, on social media, in the lives of others, and perhaps you have experienced them in your own life but the powers of evil are limited. They are deceiving and destructive. And the day is coming when God will destroy them and those who practice such art. What can we do to make sure we don't give them any control over us? Continue watching. View part six, Jesus, all things and his church. As we have already seen, Jesus is more powerful than any spirit used by those practicing the art of magic. Like the early Christians who saw in Psalms 110 verse 1, a prophecy of exaltation of Jesus, the Lord says to my son, set at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. We see that Jesus is more powerful than anything in heaven or on earth. God, according to Psalms 8, 4, and 6, has put all things under the control of Jesus. What is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? You make him to rule over the works of your hand. You have put all things under his feet. All things all things, including Satan, his evil angels, and the cosmic, supernatural, and spiritual powers have been placed under him. Know that all evil powers and those who place themselves under their control will be destroyed. Paul tells us that God made Jesus the leader of his church, his people. Therefore, to escape destruction, we must place ourselves under the authority and rulership of Jesus Christ. You see, the Father has had Jesus sit down on his throne in heaven. Jesus sitting there shows us that he has control over all things in heaven 
and on earth. Because of Jesus and what he has done for humanity, those who accept Jesus and become a part of his church, his family, are offered special gifts and blessings because Jesus sits on his father's throne with him. Notice what Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 says, and he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. God gave Jesus victory over all evil powers. God promises his church, which has identified with Christ and has been supplied by him, the guaranteed victory over Satan and all his evil spirits. Jesus gives the church everything it needs. The power of God seen in Jesus' resurrection and his exaltation over every cosmic power has been activated for his church. This is why the Bible says that the church is the same as Jesus' own body. God has given the victorious Christ to the church. We are united in Christ. Therefore, we are called his body. How can we as Christians know Jesus as king of king or our king? How can we experience God's power in our lives? Paul doesn't write any special plans or prescriptions to follow or things we must do to make this experience happen. But Paul gives us a hint in his prayer report on how we can obtain God's power. Paul prays that God will help the Ephesian Christians to know him and his power. Listen to what is said about prayer. The prayer of faith is the great strength of the Christian and will assuredly prevail against Satan. It serves his purpose well if we neglect the exercise of prayer, for then his lying wonders are more readily received. And it says, prayer is the breath of the soul. It is the secret of spiritual power. No other means of grace can be substituted and the health of the soul be preserved neglect the exercise of prayer or engage in prayer spasmodically now and then as seems convenient and you lose your hold on God. We see therefore that Paul believes that any experience or knowledge we get about God comes because we have a strong prayer life. What is your relationship with God? Do you want that source of power that Jesus offers? Then today, start by improving your prayer life. It is said that prayer is opening up your heart to God as to a friend. Open your heart to God now and see the power of God work in your life. Talk to him as you would talk to your best friend.